Good morning. You know, the thing that hits me so much about what they said is that God spoke to them and they obeyed as fast as they could. There's, there's, there's something there because it's so easy for me to hear from God and then my logic starts to kick in and was that really the Lord? And God wouldn't really want me to give $20 to this guy that I've never met before, would he? And you can, you can rationalize away God's voice. You following me? And a key to walking with God and a key to walking in victory in this life is that when God speaks to you, obey right away. Obey right away. There's truth there. Okay, I have some tweets for you, but let me get set up here just for a second. <laughs> that's, that's probably what I'm looking for. Thank you. It didn't work first service, so this is a wing and a prayer. But uh, let me give you some tweets. <laughs> Sometimes good things become bad things when they keep us from the best thing. Yeah? And what's the best thing? Him. Right? I love to read. I love to read. I read... I don't even know how many books a month I read, but I read a lot. And, um, but I can find that reading can keep me away from him. Now, reading in and of itself is not a bad thing. But a, a good thing can become a bad thing if it keeps us from the best thing. The only antidote to misery is to really trust God. Yeah? Happiness is a habit. Cultivate it. Yeah, there's truth there. I'm just going to turn it over to you. Between promise and fulfillment is a bridge called endurance. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we have to endure. So turn with me to Acts chapter 11. And before we get there, I just want to point out one thing from the previous chapter that impacted me. So we're studying the book of Acts together, and we are on chapter 11. But in chapter 10, there is a major transition that happens, a major event. What happens is that God speaks to two different men, two very different men, Peter and Cornelius. Cornelius was wealthy, Peter was not. Cornelius was a Roman, Peter was a Jew. Cornelius was a military man, an officer in the Roman army. Peter was a fisherman turned preacher. And Cornelius, through a series of events, invited Peter to his home, and no one could have predicted that God would use Peter to bring the gospel and salvation to a house full of Gentiles. Who could have thought? This was a major moment in the history of the church. It's a defining time because here God declares that the gospel is for all people and not just for the Jews. But even more than that, God shows that someone did not first have to become a Jew and follow Jewish laws and customs in order to follow Jesus. This was a turning point, a pivotal moment in the church because the prevailing thought of the day among the believers was that the gospel was for the Jews. Jesus was a Jew. The 12 disciples were Jews. The first 120 believers who gathered in the upper room were all Jews. The first 5,000 converts that Peter preached to in Jerusalem were all Jewish. Then the gospel spread to a people called the Hellenists. They didn't speak Hebrew, they spoke Greek, but they were still Jewish. Then the gospel went to Samaria in Acts chapter 8, and the Samaritans were half Jewish. So the church here is still totally composed of Jews or those of Jewish descent. And so it posed the question, do you have to become Jewish to follow Jesus? Is that a prerequisite? First you become Jewish, then you can follow Jesus. And that question is addressed here in various chapters in the book of Acts, especially in Acts 15, at the Council of Jerusalem. Do you have to be circumcised to follow Jesus? Do you have to become like a Jew to follow Jesus? And the answer is no. 
And it says, we'll get there, I love this line. It says, there was great rejoicing among the Gentile men over that answer. <laughs> but, the, <laughs> but they were forced to look at the question and God made his answer known and he began, he made his will known here in Acts 10. And it says, because the power of God fell on a Gentile household, on Cornelius' family. Look at this. It says, even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers, look at this. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. Next slide. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, can anyone object to their being baptized now that they've received the Holy Spirit just as we did? And so this group of Gentiles was baptized, making a public declaration of their allegiance to Jesus. And in addition, committing themselves to his church. There was no way to deny that God had moved among them and that salvation was for them. But this is what I want you to see. Peter could have messed this all up. How, you might ask. Peter could have let his religion keep him from obeying God. Think on that. He could have let his religious beliefs keep him from obeying God. See, God gave Peter a vision and told Peter to eat something that was considered unclean. And Peter's response was, no, Lord, Peter declared. I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure or unclean. And God responded, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. And three times it says God spoke this to Peter. But Peter could have still said, no, Lord. No, Lord. God, I know you're speaking to me, but no, Lord. That goes against my beliefs. And I wonder if Peter could have thought or struggled with, am I more committed to my religious belief system than I am to following God? Now, hear me on this. I am not talking about doctrine. But I am asking us if we could be inclined to be the same way Peter might have been inclined to be. I'm not talking about doctrine. This is the word of God. It's unalterable. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. This never changes, okay? But what I'm talking about is our traditions, our routines, our things that we might call Christian, and yet they aren't biblical, okay? So let me give you an example. What if you were raised being taught that speaking in tongues is wrong, that God did away with that, and, and it was like pounded in you, and it's ingrained in you, and then you come to a church that believes in speaking in tongues, and then you begin to study the scripture, and even the book of Acts, it's all over the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 10, in Acts chapter 11, it was the, in Acts chapter 10, it was the evidence that the Gentiles had experienced God. Peter was like, they spoke in tongues like we do. God must be real to them. And yet, what if that contradicts your belief system? And you could say, no, God, I can't speak in tongues. What would my parents think? No, Lord. And you could reject something very special that God has for you. Let me give you another example where religious belief system can get in the way of what God wants to do. So my parents started this church in 1972. And every Sunday, my dad would open the service and greet people. That was his job. He was the pastor. And so when Ken and I became the pastors, we did the same thing. But last year, we had an idea. What if we had the young people, like Kevin, open up the services? What if that happened? And someone could argue, well, that doesn't make sense, Ken and Amy. I mean, the pastor needs to open the service. The pastor needs to greet people. The people need to know who the pastor is. That's his role, and that's the way we've always done it. But where in the Bible does it say the pastor has to be the first speaker in church on Sunday morning? But we've always done it that way. So, so, 
personally, I don't know about you, but I love hearing from the young people. They are great at opening the services. I, that's like one of the best changes I think we've made in I don't know how long. I love it. It so blessed me. But we could get, yes, let's clap for that. But this is my point. We can get so stuck in traditions, in religion, in we've always done it this way, I was raised that way, this is my routine, that it can paralyze us and make us imprisoned in our past and keep God from breaking into our present. Yeah? We can get imprisoned in our past and in our religious routine and keep God from breaking into our present. Peter allowed God to change his thinking. Are we willing to do the same? Acts eleven seventeen. 17, Peter says, and since God gave these Gentiles the same gift he gave us, when we believed in the Lord Jesus, who was I to stand in God's way? I don't ever wanna be in a position where I'm standing in God's way that my religious customs are standing in the way of a new move of God. Again, I'm not talking about scripture. I'm talking about traditions and things we might call Christian, but they're not biblical. I don't ever want to stand in God's way. So moving on to chapter 11. Cornelius' whole household is saved, baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, and I can only imagine that Peter was bursting with excitement at what God had done. He can't wait to get back to his friends in Jerusalem, back to the church, and give a report. The Gentiles have turned to Jesus. The, a Roman officer has turned to Jesus. The Holy Spirit fell on him. They were speaking in tongues. We baptized them. They're now a part of the church. This is amazing. This is awesome. And Peter could not get wait, could not wait to get back and proclaim what his God had done. But look what happens. Acts 11, verse 1, read with me if you would. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, soon the news spread, the, soon the news reached the apostles and other believers in Judea that the Gentiles had received the word of the Lord. But when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticized him. You entered the home of Gentiles and even ate with them? they said. First of all, Peter didn't get to announce the news. It traveled there before he did. Isn't that funny how news travels, particularly controversial news? And so here Peter is all excited, bursting with excitement, and what happens? He hits a wall of judgment. Peter's excitement is crushed, is crushed by a blow of criticism. Peter, are you crazy? You went to, into the home of a Gentile and you even ate with them? Are you out of your mind? What is wrong with you? And I wonder if Peter felt like he was on a bit of an emotional roller coaster. Do you know what I'm talking about? The soaring joy of the excitement at Cornelius' house to come crashing down with hitting a wall of judgment when he goes back to the church. You know, recently I've been on a bit of an emotional roller coaster with my mom. She went through hip surgery. It was pretty traumatic, but incredibly successful. And just the relief and the joy that she was doing so well that the surgery was over only to discover that the swelling in, in her feet and legs was not only getting better, it was getting worse. And it, the swelling wasn't a result of her inability to walk for so long, the swelling was rather symptomatic of a very serious heart condition. And my mom needs surgery and will probably have surgery in the next couple weeks. Literally, the doctor said that it is in a critical zone. So if you would pray for her, I would appreciate it. But you know what? The joy of seeing her walk again to hearing this news, it was a blow. Peter took a blow. The excitement, the soaring joy at what had happened in Caesarea with Cornelius only to return to Jerusalem and face criticism? And I don't know about you, but I can be up at the top of the roller coaster and if I get publicly criticized, that crashes pretty fast. Do you agree? Public criticism is never fun. 
And the Amplified Bible, version of the Bible, goes and really looks at the root words, and this is the way it describes what happened to Peter. It says, so when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party, certain Jewish Christians, found fault with him, separating themselves from him in a hostile spirit, opposing and disputing and contending with him. This was an intense confrontation. Peter was publicly criticized and openly rejected with hostility for eating with the Gentiles. This was not easy. And remember the Peter from the Gospels? He was a bit of a hothead, was he not? And he could have exploded in anger here, in self-defense, in self-righteousness. He could have said, God told me to do this. I heard from God. Clearly, you all don't. And this could have caused a split in the church. Those who accepted the Gentiles and those who did it. But Peter handled it so well. He didn't explode. Instead, it says, then Peter told them exactly what happened. Peter doesn't defend himself. He just relates in a seemingly calm, gentle way. And remember the definition of gentle or gentleness? The definition of gentleness is strength under control. Strength. Peter didn't back down and go climb in a, in a hole. He stood up for what he knew was right, but with gentleness, strength under control. That's something we all need to learn. Some of us are strong like me. And you can give strong opinions, but you can get out of control. Other people don't want to face confrontation, so they shy away. But what we need is gentleness, strength under control. Peter doesn't defend himself. He explained what happened. And then it says, when the others heard this, they heard his report, they stopped objecting and began Praising God. They said, we can see that God has given the Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life. Do you see that it says they stopped objecting? So obviously there was a lot of objecting going on. <laughs> they stopped. And the result was that they all began to praise God. And it says that God gave the Gentiles the privilege of repentance. And I would just ask you this question. Do you ever view repentance as a privilege? Or do you view it as a duty, an obligation, something you're required to do? But you know what? Repentance is, is a, a privilege. And, and think of it this way. If repentance wasn't available, we'd still be dead in our sins, guilty. Repentance truly is a privilege. Keep reading with me. I just want to finish out most of this chapter, starting in verse 19. I skipped the part where Peter gives his explanation. It says, Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. And they preached the word of God, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus, and the power of the Lord was with them. And a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to God. When the church at Jerusalem heard what has happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived, he saw the evidence of God's blessing, and he was filled with joy and encouraged the believers to, say, to stay true to the Lord. He encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith, and many were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. So we are first introduced to this guy named Joseph, in Acts chapter 4, and it says there was a guy named Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, 
which means son of encouragement. They literally gave this guy Joseph a nickname. And from now on in the scripture, he goes by that nickname. His nickname is Barnabas. And Barnabas means encourager. He was given this nickname based on his personality. You know, Barnabas is one of my heroes. His personality was one that offered encouragement. My personality is not that way. My personality is one that offers truth. But I want to go to my grave with people saying, Amy was an encourager. And so I pray for myself all the time that I would be the one who offers encouragement. I pray for myself every Sunday morning, God, help me to offer encouragement at our church. Make me a Barnabas. Let me tell you a story. When Ken and I led the youth group many years ago, we did this activity. We gave the students this challenge where they had to accomplish a task and they had to work together as a team. And to solve the task, it involved some athletic ability, it involved some logic, some creativity, some planning. It was a team building exercise, okay? But we did something else. Unbeknownst to everyone, we planted a mole. Without anybody knowing, we planted a discourager in the group. And periodically, this kid would plant seeds of doubt. Now, he was very well in his negative comments, and so consequently, he was a really good discourager. I'm not sure that's a compliment. <laughs> But I will never forget this. The group was just about to figure out how to accomplish the task and succeed. They were totally thinking the right way, totally right on course, when the mole planted a negative remark. And he just said, guys, this isn't going to work. And he didn't even say why or give an explanation. But as a result of his one comment, the whole team changed directions and didn't finish their thought. And I remember the mole catching my eye and looking at me with a look that said, I can't believe I swayed them that easily. And in the end, the youth group was never able to accomplish the task. They gave up. And I wondered as I began to work on this sermon about Barnabas, what would have happened if Ken and I had planted a Barnabas instead? What would have happened if we had implanted somebody that would have encouraged the group? Now, we did it for an object lesson, and it worked out great, honestly, because we were able to talk about how he swayed everybody with one negative comment. And do we allow negative comments to sway us from maybe God's will? Or worse, are we the one giving a negative comment? <laughs> I had to say that, or lightning might strike. <laughs> My point is, is that Barnabas was an encourager, and I want us to be encouragers that will say, yeah, this is going to work. Let's try that. Let's do this. Let's encourage one another. The Bible says, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Or 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Or Hebrews 10 says, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The cry of my heart is, Lord, make me an encourager. Make me a Barnabas. You know, Acts 11.22 tells us that the church sent Barnabas to Antioch. Now, Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire at the time. It had a population of between 200 and 250,000 people. Only Rome and Alexandria were larger. And Antioch had all the stuff that big cities had. It had immorality and idolatry, and it was known for its moral corruption and its pagan practices. And remember that the believers scattered after Stephen's stoning, and many fled to Antioch. And the believers there, it says, the power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to God. So the church in Jerusalem sent Barnabas to this huge city. And as he arrives... In Antioch, there's this little phrase that I want to focus on. I want you to see. It says this. When he arrived, he saw the evidence of God's blessing. 
That's new living. Every other translation that I looked at, literally, every other translation says it differently. It says some form of, he saw the grace of God. Do you know in life you find what you're looking for? Except keys. I can never find my keys. I lose my keys all the time. It's a hereditary disease that I got from my dad. But apart from your keys or maybe your cell phone, in life, you tend to find what you're looking for. For example, someone could have a hundred things right about them. They could have amazing talents and gifts and strengths and abilities. But if you are looking for what's wrong with them, you'll find something. Same is true at church. There are a lot of great things about our church. We're a loving family. We're a house of prayer. We're a temple of worship. I love our worship. We are working at racial healing and reconciliation. We share the gospel. We take care of the poor. We are doing a lot of things right. But if you're here and you come in and you start looking for what's wrong, you'll find things. Because our church isn't perfect because it's made up of imperfect people. If you're at work, let's say you're driving to work tomorrow. And you decide on the drive-in that you're going to try to come up with five things that are wrong with your job. Do you know what will happen? You'll come up with ten. <laughs> and if you have a not-so-smart moment, and don't all of us have not-so-smart moments at times, at least I do. If you have a not-so-smart moment and you begin to complain to your coworker about the ten things that you came up with, they'll double it and give you ten more. That's life. And you can begin to think, I don't want to work here anymore. <laughs> Display number one. And nobody better say amen to this one. I don't want to go to church here anymore. Or I don't want to be married anymore. Or, you know, this is where it gets really serious. And I felt like the Lord told me to put this in because I took it out and put it back in and took it out and put it back in, literally. But we can get so overwhelmed with negativity that the worst case scenario is I don't want to live anymore. And how did the downward spiral start? It started by what were you looking for? See, I propose that the reason Barnabas saw the evidence of God's blessing in the corrupt city of Antioch, the reason he saw the grace of God there was because that's what he was looking for. He was looking for the good, focused on the good, not looking at the bad. And you know what happened in Antioch as a result of Barnabas going there, I think? Look at the results. Tradition holds, tradition holds that the first Gentile church was founded in Antioch. And we learn from what we read that the first place that the followers of Jesus were called Christians was in Antioch. And perhaps with the exception of Jerusalem, Antioch played a more important role in the church than any other city in the world. It became the epicenter at which spread the gospel. The Apostle Paul, for example, made Antioch his home base when he launched his various missionary journeys. Antioch was home. And you know this? The corrupt city of Antioch earned a nickname too, like Barnabas. The nickname that the corrupt city of Antioch earned was the cradle of Christianity. It's Antioch, the cradle of Christianity. And I can't help but wonder, what role did Barnabas have in that? I mean, what if Barnabas had gone to the city and instead of being focused on the corruption and the pagan practices and the immorality and the idolatry, what if he wrote a scathing letter to the Jerusalem church telling how awful the city was? Could that have changed history? Perhaps. But instead, he saw the grace of God. And this is my word for you today, and this is my word for me today today. But look for the grace of God in people. Look for the grace of God in your husband or your wife. Look for the grace of God in your children. 
Look for the grace of God. And my son's back there going, yes, do that. I couldn't help that. Look for the grace of God in your parents, in your boss, in your pastor. Look for the grace of God at your job, at your church, in your neighborhood, at your children's school. And let me add this, because I think this is very important. Look for the grace of God in yourself. It's so easy to beat ourselves up. It's so easy to say, I wish I was better at this and that and this and that. Look for the grace of God in yourself, because you know what? You find what you're looking for. Let me close by saying this. Can I just be real with you? For me personally, this has been a really rough year. It's been tough. For all kinds of reasons. And I was crying out to God recently and just asking for his help. I have this closet at my home that I have a keyboard in and I just go in there and worship, but sometimes I just go in there and pray. And I had gone in there to pray, I was pretty distraught. And I was just crying out to God and asking for his help and asking for his hope. And I heard the Lord so clearly state to me, Amy, instead of focusing on all the bad things that are happening right now, look for the good. Find the good. And find things to give thanks to me for. And so that prompted this message. And, and, and so I did, and I just began to thank God for my family and for my husband and for my kids and for my mom and for my sister and for health and for salvation, for hope that doesn't depend on what happens tomorrow, but hope that's based on God who's in charge. And I thank God for this church. We're not perfect, but we're doing okay, right? And I thank God for so many of you. I thank God for you, and I thank God for you, and I thank God for you. And I just started going through people I know and I thank God for you and for you and for George and Melanie and I thank God for you and it's just like you know what it didn't make my problems go away it didn't but it changed my attitude because it changed my heart and it helped me and it renewed my hope see Barnabas Sarah will you come up here with people Barnabas saw the grace of, of God because that's what he was looking for and in this life what you look for you will find and so my closing statement to you is, is just this have the eyes of Barnabas you just say that, pray that for yourself God give me the eyes of Barnabas the eyes that can go into something and see grace instead of corruption, instead of crime. Barnabas, when he went into the city, he could have saw, he could have, I'm sure he saw corruption. I'm sure he saw idolatry. I'm sure he saw immorality. I'm sure he saw crime. But that's not what he focused on. He said he saw evidence of God's blessing. He focused on grace. And that's the way I want to live. Will you stand with me? Jesus, we just come before you. And God, I just lay hands on my eyes, Lord, and I just ask you to give me the eyes of Barnabas. Give me the eyes of Barnabas, Lord, that in other people and in myself, in situations, in places, that I would look for the good, that I'd see the good. God, give us the eyes of Barnabas and ultimately the eyes of Jesus. Make me an encourager, Lord. Make us encouragers. Make us encouragers. Bless the Lord.